Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation for inviting me to give a talk today. Uh, my name is Professor Robert Thomas. I'm a consultant in Cambridge and Bedford in the UK. And I suppose I'm a little bit unique. I'm also a professor of exercise and nutritional science in the local university in Bedfordshire. So I'm going to talk today about um, generally what research is behind lifestyle advice. Uh, there's a lot of myth out there. Um, but first of all, before that, I'd like to say when you talk about lifestyle, this is not to blame anyone. Um, it's to give advice, uh, hopefully evidence based advice where uh, individuals can choose if they want to take it or not. It's not to blame. You can be as fit as this girl on the left or you can have a lifestyle a bit like me and man on the right. Or you can just have, um, you know, you can be unlucky with your genes and you can have, uh, you can get cancer or any disease. So this is not to blame, it's to get information. Nevertheless, uh, Cancer Research UK do estimate that uh, just under half of the cancers which do exist are probably uh, directly related to uh, the lifestyle we lead. Um, so, you know, there is an, uh, there is an element there, uh, which, um, which I'll talk about today. But it's not just about getting cancer or preventing relapse. Um, lifestyle factors is really about the quality of the life you choose to live. That's either, you know, whether you've got cancer or whether you haven't got cancer. So certainly, as many of the audience know, if you've had cancer, you've been through surgery, you've been through uh, maybe radiotherapy, chemotherapy, biological treatments. And all these, although they're getting better, they have lots of side effects, you know, fatigue, heartburn, increased risk of osteoporosis, increased risk of infection, which of course is relevant now with COVID. And I'm trying to find out through our research unit, which, uh, which lifestyle factors has the biggest impact for someone, because it's not easy to change your lifestyle after cancer. So, and there's a lot of conflicting evidence out there. Um, you know, it used to be that there wasn't enough evidence uh, 20 years ago when I started down this route, but now it's usually there's too much uh, conflicting um, data and it, it just confuses people and demotivates people. So if you've got a clear message, I think more people and individuals are more likely to uh, have a clear behavioral change strategy. Uh, so this is why uh, in our unit in the UK, we decided to ch change our emphasis, although we still do mainstream st uh, stream studies, to look at lifestyle uh, factors. So we do evidence reviews, uh, we do surveys with patients, asking them um, you know, what matters more and what symptoms are most important. And ultimately, we design randomized trials. And with this information, we obviously publish it and hopefully that guides other clinicians. We uh, advise patient advocacy groups, what should be in their information booklets. Uh, we write a, a blog where if someone comes up to us and says, uh, you know, should I be taking vitamin C? Should I be fasting during chemotherapy? We sort of do evidence reviews based on popular questions. Uh, and, you know, a bit of a plug there, but I've, uh, I put all that in data into uh, my book, which comes out every few years as well. Um, and the things we're concentrating on mainly at the moment is uh, sugar intake, exercise, polyphenol rich fruits, and others, fruit and vegetables, obesity, gut health and inflammation in the aim to, to primarily improve quality of life, but also re reduce the risk of chronic illness after cancer and try to fight the cancer itself and reduce the risk of infections. This isn't new, however, the, the, the seed and soil hypothesis concentrating on the person rather than the actual cancer, you know, dated back to Stephen Paget in the turn of the century when he said that researchers should be looking at the seed rather than the soil, you know, the seed being, um, you know, should, sorry, the soil rather than seed. So the soil being our bodies. And uh, even, even more recently, MD Anderson um, published a very good trial showing that you get a 40% increased response rate to these new targeted biological therapies uh, if you have better gut health or you're physically fitter. And not only do you get a better response rate, you get less toxicity. So in this era of targeted therapies, it's even more important to start looking at our bodies and try and arm our bodies to, to go in partnership with the treatments coming up. So let's start with exercise. 
Um, there's lots of data out there. This is a meta-analysis of 45 observational studies, which show, and most of them pretty much agree, that you should be aiming for over three hours a week of moderate intensity exercise, where you get yourself hot and sweaty. Um, so, you know, if, if you've had cancer, even though it's difficult, you know, try to get yourself out most days. Uh, this is These are two evidence reviews we wrote as well, if anyone's interested. Um, and this was a this was a paper we wrote with Stacy Kenfield from um, University of Southern California, looking at why exercise has anti-cancer properties. Um, and this was published in British Journal of Sports Medicine. And we split it into sort of indirect and direct benefits. Indirect being, you know, it helps with weight loss, it improves vitamin D, it can improve circadian rhythm in the morning, improve mood and gut health. Uh, but it does have some direct biochemical changes. It can reduce estrogen levels in people, women who are overweight, for example. It can improve insulin sensitivity. It has it improves the expression of the genes which protect you against cancer, called epigenetic expression of disease, and it's generally anti-inflammatory and antioxidative. So there's lots of things which happen. In fact, it's estimated that 180 factors uh, change in your bloodstream after a good exercise session but it's important to get appropriate exercises and the best regimes are usually supervised because they can target what you need out of exercise so if it's weight reduction more cardiovascular things stress reduction you know yoga osteoporosis weight bearing and above all you know when you start exercising many people you know they don't have the balance uh the stability and they can fall and hurt themselves and also a good exercise professional will talk about diet because actually, if you overdo exercise, you can create too many free radicals, and um, and and that's well known. So that's why it's important to gradually graduate the exercise program and make sure you have lots and lots of sort of um, herbs, spices, fruit and vegetables, or polyphenol-rich foods, which enhance the antioxidative adaptive response to exercise. So when should you start exercising? Well, basically, we should all be exercising from childhood, but of course after cancer, it's really straight away because um, there's a, a thing called prehabilitation where you exercise before your surgery or before your chemotherapy or biological treatment. And there's lots of evidence coming through now that you can prepare yourself. If you exercise before your surgery, you're more likely to leave hospital, less likely to get an infection or a DVT or anything serious. And, you know, coming through, there's actually data now showing that if you're physically fit, you're less likely to catch COVID in hospitals, which obviously is a big issue in the UK. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge for us, of course, is, is to get people into an exercise program uh, you know, straight away when they've got all these other things to think about just being diagnosed with cancer. But the same applies if you're about to start a course of chemotherapy or go in for uh, another operation, even if you've already been diagnosed. Um, and during chemotherapy, it's, I hear over and over again people saying, uh, you know, they, they, they should take it easy during chemo. This is called the PACES study where um, there was a, a randomization between a high intensity and a standard or low intensity exercise regime. And the higher intensity regime improved people's functioning. They had less pain, but muscle strength uh, and uh, their bloods recovered quicker. Um, so coming on to overweight. Now, it's very obvious that um, uh, being overweight or obese is, is a very complex issue. Uh, many people struggle with their weight after cancer, you know, from the immobility, the steroids, the chemotherapy, you know, and it's not just that you need to do more exercise and eat less burgers. It's, it's all related to mood, gut health, cultural histories, physical levels, hormonal. So um, people often say, well, what are the th three biggest things I can concentrate on? Well, this was a trial uh, published in JAMA saying that 13 hours of overnight fasting um, uh, reaps enormous benefits. OK, this was on breast cancer and, you know, chol cholangiocarcinoma is a different thing and people might be more worried about weight loss. But if you're in a group where, where you don't have the weight loss, 13 hours of fasting is uh, is very, you know, it's an easy thing to do and it reduces inflammation and um, it, the weight uh, comes off quite quickly. Take regular exercise first thing in the morning, which extends the overnight fast. 
and to reduce processed sugar intake. Why processed sugar? Because you, as you get this hit when you have something sugary, you feel good for about half an hour, and then your levels, your insulin goes up, your, your sugar levels drop, you feel hungry, fatigued, you eat more, so overall your calorie intake goes up. And also, sugar um, it does tend to feed the unhealthy bacteria in the gut and uh, causes uh, problems with gut health and all sorts of issues. Um, Giving people polyphenol rich foods, um, such as herbs, spices, fruit and vegetables, they actually slow the glycemic index down. They slow the transport of sugar across the gut wall and they also reduce oxidative stress. So that's why fruit and veg, although they contain sugar, they don't have the same problems with glycemic index. So what do we do when patients come to our unit? We display lots of sweets and sometimes people are given bags full of sweets. Um, which is obviously, I think, a bad message. So this is a study we did uh, last year where we um, we replaced the fruit, the, the sweets from visible surfaces in nursing stations and reception desks. We replaced it with fruit and nuts, and we measured uh, happiness scale, weight, uh, and absenteeism. And uh, we were very pleased to say there was a statistically significant reduction in uh, excess weight. Nurses felt happier and the patients themselves thought it was a nice gesture. So we're trying to now expand that to other hospitals. We haven't got very far yet. It's a lot of resistance, but it just goes to show it's uh, we need to lead by example. Coming on to these foods I've mentioned before, polyphenol, phytochemical rich foods. These uh, you know, these are present in anything, tea, coffee, chocolate, even wine, uh, but of course, above all, berries, nuts, fruits and vegetables. And there's lots of studies which show after cancer, if you increase the intake of these foods, you have a lower risk of relapse. And this, most of the data, as I said, from this tends to come from, you know, ovary, breast, uh, prostate, bowel, etc. But there's no reason to believe that this data doesn't apply to you know all tumours because it's not tumour specific. Um, and the, the amount you need to eat is, is usually a lot more than you think. So it should be with every meal and much higher quantities. Why do these foods have anti-cancer properties? Well, they, they enhance the inflammatory uh, regulatory system. So they produce appropriate inflammation by up-regulating inflammatory pathways when needed, and they reduce inflammation when it's not needed, so reduce chronic inflammation. They also improve epigenetic expression, they help gut health, and they have some direct anti-cancer properties such as reducing proliferation, etc. And above all, they also uh, supplement the antioxidant pathway, so they increase antioxidant enzymes when they're needed, and they down-regulate them when they don't, unlike direct antioxidants I'll come to later. Um, is there any evidence in, in other, for other things? This was a study we did with the National Cancer Institute where we looked at 155,000 people and looked at their tea intake. And we were pleased to say that um, in general, if you have a, more than a couple of cups of tea a day, you have a slightly reduced risk of prostate cancer. So you know, that just proves that tea is healthy. Uh, probably not if you add sugar though. The same uh, analysis was done with broccoli. I mean, this is of no surprise to anyone. If you eat more broccoli, you get more less, about 5% less cancers. So, you know, tea and broccoli is a good combination. How do we increase our polyphenols? Well, you know, just put them into the diet. Uh, you can sprout vegetables. Uh, you can uh, eat, just eat lots of crucial vegetables, fruits, shots, blenders. These are all good ways uh, to increase them. Be careful with fruit in blenders because they can break down the, uh, the sugars and you get a bit too much of a sugar rush. Whether to put them in supplements, well, that's uh, well, not really controversial, but uh, you know, it's not the aim. It's always best to stick to diet. But nevertheless, supplements are popular. This was a study we published in Adelaide last uh, two years ago, actually, which showed that about 64% of our patients, it was a survey of nearly a thousand patients do take supplements, particularly if they have a symptom such as joint pain, hot flushes or things. So they're very popular and most of them aren't evidence-based. And you have to be very careful with some supplements which are direct antioxidants because we do need some antioxidative stress and uh, you know, a happy cell has, has, has a few free radicals swelling around. Um, and the, you know, through my role as an exercise 
professional um i can uh, in the university you know we're very weary of of supplements which contain vitamin e and vitamin a for example because these are direct antioxidants and they block the natural adaptive process of the antioxidant enzymes and actually results in poorer performance um so and the same applies for cancer there's a number of studies out there which show if you take the uh, vitamin a and vitamin e um over 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 years um then uh, and you have normal levels to start with you actually get too much antioxidant uh, stress and then you get an increased risk of cancer and i've listed the trials which show that here um so what does sloan kettering and and big organizations say they say don't take a vitamin supplement unless you suspect you're deficient so for example vitamin d in the uk is a safe one to take and i do recommend that to everyone but i wouldn't there's some i wouldn't um, but this is not the same as whole food uh, supplements which contain whole foods these this is just a way of boosting intake and you know many people don't want to increase the intake of these foods so a whole polyphenol rich supplement is convenient for them and this was a study we did about five years ago which uh, randomized people taking a supplement with green tea pomegranate broccoli and turmeric against placebo and we saw a significant effect on psa uh, and that correlated with underlying uh, signs of the um of the cancer on mri now of course there's very few of these studies showing this could help other tumor types but at least it showed that boosting the diet with these foods in one cancer type was beneficial and uh, unlike the memorial stone kettering which criticized uh, vitamin a and e supplements uh, the national cancer institute actually recommends these foods and quotes the trial on their first page so uh, you know there's a very different attitude towards them they also these polyphenols have um, other benefits uh, they, they can help with joint uh, pains which is common after cancer more common after cancer uh, they can help with gut health and they actually have uh, direct antiviral properties and i'm bringing this up now because of course of the covid epidemic and there's a lot of evidence from the last sars outbreak and, and with seasonal flu that they can reduce viral repl replication um polyphenols can be found or phytochemicals can be found um, in other substances like essential oils and uh, maybe they can be used as topical therapies um they an area not really explored but um, this was a, this is a side effect of taxotere, a commonly used drug in oncology, where nothing much was is done about it, and patients are just left to suffer. So we worked with uh, some very clever uh, botanical scientists who said, "Well, look, there are things like Leleshua, African sage, which have anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, antimicrobial, and moisturizing properties, and it, you know it could be possible if you apply these to the nails before chemotherapy, it could reduce this." Uh, so we, we um, a company put something together for us uh, based on the scientific panel's recommendation and we did a randomized trial only 60 people but we were actually staggered to see that actually nail health improved slightly despite chemotherapy in the active group and actually decreased um, by you know the predictable about 60 percent in in the placebo group um so you know we're very pleased uh that that was highly significant and nature coming to the rescue and all our patients in our center now get this free at the start of their chemotherapy course um coming on to gut health um we know that uh you know many of you would have heard about gut health what it means uh, effectively, it's an overgrowth of the pro-inflammatory bacteria and the colonization of the anti-inflammatory bacteria are diminished. This leads to, you know, apart from just feeling a bit bloaty and having indigestion, it actually leads to the thinning of the gut lining, uh, opening up of the gaps between the cells. So uh, a reduction in the payers patches, which is the immune patches in the gut, and it leads to impaired gut integrity, or some people call it leaky, leaky gut syndrome. So that means toxins leak into the bloodstream and nutrients leak out. And those toxins uh, then create an inflammatory response. Um, they use up the inflammatory pathways. So you end up getting reduced immune surveillance. And then at the same time, you get an excess uh, chronic inflammation, which is inappropriate and not really doing a lot except causing damage. Um, so that's why we, we within the gut, it's common to have uh, ulcers, bloating, uh, constipation, diarrhea, uh, and increased risk of bowel cancer and possibly other cancers. 
Uh, but outside the gut, uh, there's issues as well, including cancers elsewhere. And as I've mentioned before, there's a reduced chance of responding to immune therapies. Now, we're all familiar with the gut brain axis. As I've said, if you have a bad gut, you're more likely to get poor mood, depression, dementia, and neurodegenerative problems, all common, more common after cancer. But it's actually, there is a, there's a gut lung access, which is less well talked about, but it's there's lots of evidence to show if you have poor gut health, it's associated with a poor microbiome within the lungs, which means you're more likely to get allergies, colds, infections. If you get an infection, it's more likely to get to your lung and causing a pneumonitis or ADRDS. And, you know, obviously many of our patients over the last year, uh, slightly more likely if you're on chemo, end up, you know, with lungs like this, if they get a viral infection, particularly COVID. Um, so how do you improve your gut health? Um, there's you know, many, many things we can do. Um, there's the eating lots of healthy bacteria in kimchi, uh, sauerkraut, um, yogurt, live yogurt, kefir, etc. There's the, the uh, lifestyle factors such as psychological stress, if you can de-stress yourself, exercise improves gut health, smoking, uh, lots of fatty meats decrease it and processed sugar feeds the unhealthy bacteria. Um, but it's also the pre prebiotics which are health which are important, like artichokes, mushrooms, broccoli, beans. These are the things which help feed the healthy bacteria, so they grow and they there's, they don't create. There's less space for the unhealthy ones to grow. Should you be taking probiotic supplements? There's no evidence if you have a healthy gut, they help. Although there's a lot of research, including a large project going on in Cambridge, is seeing whether we can take specific probiotics to, to aid specific treatments, but that's ongoing. In general, the evidence is if you've had a course of antibiotics, chemo, radiotherapy, you've taken some non steroidals or you're traveling, you just had an alcoholic binge, you're more likely to get a benefit um, uh, from a course. So, um, yeah, but not all the time. And we've done an evidence review there on this site, keephealthy.com, if anyone wants to read that. There's also quite a lot of evidence to say that people who take probiotics have a redu reduced risk of a viral infections and colds. And a lot of athletes take them because they don't want to get a cold and break their training, for example. So that leads us to um, just a couple of trials and not specifically cancer related, but, you know, as you know, oncology is being devastated by uh, by COVID in this country. People are presenting late. Um, you know, people are coming in for bone scans and catching COVID and have to have breaks in chemotherapy. Their operations have been delayed. And as a lifestyle unit, uh, we're, we're, which are used to this sort of research, we've actually branched out a little bit and we're helping with the fight against COVID. So this was one study we've um, started in May last year, which was a double blind evaluation of uh, probiotics and a polyphenol rich capsule to see if it would shorten the risk, shorten the duration of COVID infections. And I'd like to thank uh, the Captain Tom Appeal, who's indirectly funded this study through the Bedford Hospital Charity, where he unfortunately succumbed to his illness in the end. Um, so this intervention is, is giving foods which are most likely to have antiviral properties and uh, based on the existing evidence, and these were things like aloe vera, chamomile, uh, citrus bioflavonoids, and the, the probiotics were, which have the strongest anti uh, gut enhancing or antiviral effects were the, mainly the lactobacillus series supported by a prebiotic. And this is just a straightforward uh, double blind randomized trial where uh, the, the food capsule is given to half the patients and a placebo in the other half. But there's an open element uh, of everyone getting the, uh, the probiotic, which is supplied by Your Gut Plus. And uh, the, the, um, the reason why we had to do the open is because nobody would enter the study unless we gave them probiotics. So um, um, we're also branching out to another study where, we're, uh, where there's, we've looked at the evidence of how we can enhance the response to the vaccine. And there's quite a lot of evidence if you exercise at the time of your vaccine or you take a probiotic, you're more likely to get improved titers um, a few months later. This evidence, however, comes from uh, the flu vaccine. Uh, we don't know if it applies to COVID. Uh, we did an evidence review again on this subject. Called, uh, and again, that's on the keephealthy.com website. 
Um, but, you know, it, what we've done is said, well, look, you know, now we're all having the vaccine. We just set up a quick study where um, a two to one randomization where they're given probiotics and an exercise program against standard of care. And we're measuring antibody titers um, four weeks down the uh, four to five weeks down the line and another one at eight weeks. So, uh, you know, that's a nice little study which fits in with our portfolio. And, uh, you know, it, it, it does affect cancer patients because if, the quicker we get rid of COVID in general or make the antibody more effective, the more we can get on with our oncology treatments. So um, that's a, a rather rushed <laughs> uh, whistle top stop tour. There's lots of aspects of lifestyle which I haven't uh, mentioned. Hopefully they're going to be discussed elsewhere in this uh, excellent conference. Uh, but. Uh, if you want to follow our research, the best way is to sign up to our newsletter, which you can get uh, via the cancernet.co.uk. Uh, newsletter comes out every month or so, or probably less frequent than that. Um, we've got some social media, Facebook, etc. Uh, our blog, uh, we do a, a topic about once a month, and it, I think they're quite relevant to, to people. And if we, we we address our own research, but also research from around the world. And, and uh, if there's any questions, please feel free to uh, email me directly. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks.